Hey okay, everybody, we're here with my lovely friend, Chris. And how long have you been in Vietnam? Uh, this current trip, almost a year now. In a month, it'll be a year. Where was home originally? Uh, for me, it was LA. So I was born in Los Angeles, uh, in the San Fernando Valley, 818. This is not every day when someone's like, I'm going to live in Vietnam. So let's go into the story of like, did you come here before? Because some overseas Vietnamese, they come here to travel mm -hmm. like once or twice. And they have this like itch. Did you have that? I think it was kind of random for me. Um, a lot of things in my life have been that way. But I came for the very first time when I was 18. 2003, right after high school, my dad took me back here and I invited my high school friends. So there was a, a group of four of us. So four dudes and my dad. And it was the first time coming back here, I was 18. And I can't say it left any big impression on me. I was like a dumb kid, teenager. You know, I was just here, like, some things I could eat, some things I couldn't. It was loud. It was noisy. And how was your overall, like, Vietnamese, like, identity from 0 to 18 mm. before that trip? Yeah, I would say it's actually pretty unique just because I'm not that young, right? I'm, like, older millennial. Uh, first of all the grandkids on my, my mom's side, uh, now there are 27 of us. So me being the first, I had a lot of exposure to Vietnamese. So you can see kind of like this higher fluency with the older kids and then the fluency kind of drops as you go younger. So because I had the language really, really young, I was always really comfortable with Vietnamese. I was always really comfortable around Vietnamese people, around my uncles, my aunts, and I was able to navigate the culture very easily because of the language, I think. Were you brought up in like a majority white school? Was it like Asian through like elementary, middle school? Like how was like, did you rep being Vietnamese? I think LA where I grew up was pretty diverse. Like I think as diverse as you can get. Every Asian group was there. So we grew up pretty much like deep in the ASEAN culture, <laughs> you know, like ASEAN pride, you know. Got rice. Got rice, all of that stuff. I had like the slick back hair, the high fade. You know, the look, the everything. Blonde bangs, I, didn't do my, I didn't do the blonde bangs, but, you know, I was, like, uh, close enough. I had bangs. But, yeah, that was our Vietnamese culture. You know, that was, like, our distinct Vietnamese community. And we felt 100% Vietnamese. Of course, we knew there was, like, a, a Vietnam on the periphery. That was, like, the real Vietnam. That's the, that's the motherland. But we felt as Vietnamese as you could be, you know. And, and it, it isn't until now, looking back, it's like we were just trying to figure it out. A lot of it was kind of confusing, but we were really proud of repping Vietnamese, our own version. Were there instances of like, did you were ever bullied or like ostracized for being Vietnamese? Just speaking about the neighborhood where I grew up, we had a lot of gangs. Yeah. You know, gangs are usually uh, separated by race, right? So you had like gang related fights at school and it was always like, very racial. It was like black versus brown or Mexican Asians people. versus, you know, white kids today or like, yeah, it felt like prison, you know? So there was kind of like that, oh, you got to stick to your own. Yeah. You know, it felt like that, you know, as a kid. I mean, obviously now going back, I'd be like, hey, I'm going to hang out with everybody. But back then it, it felt like you were pressured to be with your, your people because you needed to for protection. Safety. When you're 18 years old, making that first trip out to Vietnam with a bunch of homies and your dad, yeah. Like partying, doing the typical what the overseas would come over here and do that whole lifestyle. Like you said, it didn't really leave an impression. So like yeah. what, what was your overall thoughts on that trip? I think it was the fact that, I mean, first of all, I was 18. So I was still pretty dumb. <laughs> you know, like my life was just like, look cool, be funny and get girls, you know. And like, that's what we try to do in Vietnam. I was with my three buddies. So we just, yeah, we just went around and just went crazy. We were like trying to hit up the, the, the neighbors, you know, like if they had a daughter or something like that, we would, you know, ask wait, them. Wait, wait. Was, was your Vietnamese as good as it is now? My Vietnamese was good. Yeah. yeah. I don't think Give me it was... a line. Give me a line. Like how you're like, oh, say... the neighbor comes by, it's like <laughs> oh, smoking. No, what but... would you say? Oh man, we wouldn't talk to her, you know, but like, I think, um, oh dude, I would use my dad. I was like, hey dad. Can you go in there and like talk to them and like can you ask like you know so yes, you, you, mine. you be cool with them so we can take their daughters out you know it worked you know we took them out and stuff like that like I I think we were pretty naive because it's like those girls weren't out to just have fun with us like it seemed like they were thinking about the future 
already. We're, we're just like, we're just taking them out for like one, you know, outing to get ice cream or something like that, you know? And then uh, I think one night, um, after taking them out a couple times, uh, my dad did approach us and was like, uh, yeah, they, they want to marry one of you guys? Like, yeah. Well, they picked me and uh, my white homie, Jeff. Oh, yeah, it was quick, man. It was a couple of days, dude. Yeah, yeah, so... We just had a laugh about it. We didn't. We didn't. We didn't do anything crazy. You and know? then did you just like ghost them, or like what? What happened afterwards? I don't know what happened. We they didn't. They didn't stay in contact with us. I don't think they they saw any future in us. Um, I came back again my last year of university. Yeah. So I did a study abroad program. So again, just kind of random because uh, I wanted to go to Japan, but I didn't make the GPA for Japan. So then they were just like, "Hey, we still got Vietnam. You can do Vietnam." I'm like, "Oh shoot." I didn't even think about that. So I signed up. So it was kind of random and changed my life, that trip. But were your intentions going into like explore more of Vietnam or was it just like, oh, Vietnam. It's kind of like, I'm of Vietnamese descent. Yeah, cool. We'll go and kind of figure it out. Yeah, I think that was my, my initial mindset yeah. was just like, okay, cool. Let's see what this is about. You know, like I didn't come into it with a whole lot of expectations or anything. Yeah, I was just curious. Cool. So then... Let's go back to when you were here for five years. Mm -hmm. Like, what did you have intentions then where you're like, okay, Vietnam, I'm going to plan my roots? Or was mm -hmm. it also sort of spontaneous again where you're like, okay, I'm going to take this one year, and then one year became a little longer? Mm, yeah, exactly that. It was the one year kind of like, hey, I'll just head back, see how it is. It became four, actually. So uh, can you tell us before the audience, like, what did you come here first doing for that, those five years? Like uh -huh. the first year, what, what were you doing? Yeah, so this is after I did that study abroad program. And I was, I would say in love with Vietnam yeah. after that. It was like so deep. I couldn't get myself away. I wanted to build a life that had to do with Vietnam. So then... Was there uh, something that like clicked finally? Because the first two times you're like, eh. Yeah. And then yeah. something happened? It wasn't one thing, I think. It was being a student there instead of like just a kid following my family around. I was a student. I was living there basically on my own, no family. And we were at the university campus and we were around a lot of young people, you know? So I was on like a mission to discover, yeah. you know? I wasn't just like tagging along and just kind of superficially experiencing everything. I was like exploring and being very inquisitive. And actually the program itself is a academic program. So I'm there like reading books, doing research about Vietnam. I had to go deep, yeah. you know? And then like that just uncovered like this entire, I don't know, like hidden passion I had for Vietnam. Like it just, I felt at home, like even then, you know? So then I was like, I, I gotta come back. And it was my friends, it was these like really sweet moments I had and this like really comforting fe feeling of like almost like family. You know, this was like, I already found like another family, another home here. You know, I felt, I felt that during that time. So when I came back to do the one year, I was like super excited. You know, I'm, I'm here to live in Vietnam and I'm going to give it a year because like that's scary. You know, like anyone yeah. coming, like making that move is like no one's jumping into it. Like I'm, I'm going to be here forever <laughs> or like 10 years. You know, it's usually a gotta, one year plan. Like you have to feel it. It's, it's like a relationship. You got to like test the waters. Exactly. And then also like, you know, I came in as a teacher. So I did my CELTA certification while I was overseas and then I did the teacher thing. So I already um, got accepted to do the one month uh, teacher training. And what year was this? This was in 2011. So one of the biggest, I would say, concerns of being what we call VITQ or overseas Vietnamese is like discrimination. Mm -hmm. Being not privileged, not AKA white. So did you face that when you were teaching back yeah. then? 2011, I would say there was like not a lot of like people talking about it. Did you face like, oh, I'm getting paid less. Mm, Things yeah. are a little weirder for me because um, with you? Actually, I only remember two moments. So there was one moment when I was fresh. I just started teaching at the center and there were parents who were complaining because they saw my last name, was Tran, and then they brought their kids and they saw this Vietnamese looking teacher and they wanted to pull their kids out. And this my, is after you were speaking, like fluent. This is after like, I think a few days of the course already. Really? It was already started and like um, they wanted to pull their kids out of the, the class because... I didn't seem like a, I don't, a native speaker or whatever. And my manager stood up for me, yeah. you know? So he said like, hey, you know, this guy's born in the U.S. He was educated in the U.S. He's as much of a native speaker as anybody else. So if you want to take your kids out, take your kids out. Having been your own technically people yeah. be like, yeah. you're not good. You're not white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like how, how was that initial like 
with their knee jerk, like, what the hell? Yeah, there was kind of like this kind of confusion. Yeah, when I had somebody try to offer like tutoring, like, hey, like, you know, can you tutor my kid, you know? And then I gave them a price, which was like, after asking around, was the market price for any native speaking teacher? And they were like, wait, but you're Vietnamese. Like, you should get paid less, you know? And I was like, wait, what? You know, I was like, if anything, I should get paid more because I'm fluent in both languages. I'm, I would be a more effective teacher for you. Take back a flashback. Oh, I'm 18. I'm going to do this again. Like the party lifestyle or how was your first year? And how old were you at that time? You can take us back. Oh, man. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't let go of the party in me, I guess. Like I, I was partying a lot yeah. that first year I was here, but I was also working, you know, and working at the language center. Um, it's not easy because... The training is great, but nothing prepares you for actually stepping into the classroom and like working with a lot of kids and like, you know, just the whole industry. And in the beginning, like you don't get paid that much, right? Can we ask you what was your initial starting hourly wage at the center? Oh, dude, hourly wage? I think I was making like maybe like 13 bucks an hour, I think. What is that in? About 300,000, a little more than that. Yeah, as like a temp. Um, because they were promising that after six months, then I would get like the full time. And, but I think it was more about how many hours of teaching that they would give me at the center. So I think I was taking home like barely like 700 bucks on my own at that time. And I made the mistake of going to Vietnam with like, I still had debt, you know, I still had things um, that I had to pay for back in the States. I was just like itching to go. So I should have like taken care of all that, but I was like, I gotta, I gotta get out of the how States. Old were you? I was 25. 25. Yeah. And at that time you were making, what's that, 11 mil a month? Something like that. How were you like, what, what was, do you remember your like cost of living? Were you like renting a pretty uh, affordable place? Yeah, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I, I had roommates. Yeah. So I, at one point I had three and then one left, so then I had two, so we kind of split that, you know? Um, and then I, yeah, I just budgeted like crazy, but I remember being really stressed out and standing with my, 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 my homie and my roommate at that time and just telling him, like, dude, I, I didn't come here to live like this, <laughs> you know? Like, I'm budgeting so hard in a country that feels like I should be really enjoying the small things, like, you know, eating street food and, like, not having to think about everything I pay for, but, like, sure. it doesn't feel good to come to Vietnam and have to budget hard yeah. on everything, you know? It's just like, man, I should head back, you know? But uh, eventually I made more money, so... Yeah, then it became really fun. But looking back now, like, man, I was grinding, yeah. you know, like... At 25. At 25, yeah. because the hours that you had to put in to do that, right? I wasn't, I didn't have a business or something like that. I, I had nothing I could scale. Like, I literally had to sit across from students to make more money. So a week, I was spending so much time either in the classroom or in front of someone teaching one-on-one -on -one or small groups. So... Yeah, I was working hard. During those times, were you happy? I was happy, but I think I had like this mentality of like, even though I'm working hard, this is how it should be. You know, I think I carry that over from my parents, you know, first gen, where it's just like, if you need more money, work more. And that's what I was doing. I was like, hey, I want to have this lifestyle. I want more money. So I got to work, 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 work. So it was weird. Like my parents were freaking out because they're like, what are you doing in Vietnam? Like, you're just like playboy over there, you know? And I'm like, you guys have no idea. I'm grinding like crazy. I work so much, you know? And because I had to work so much, like, I didn't really do much, you know? Like, what well, the thing is, when you do have free time in Vietnam, it's still a lot easier to enjoy life, I think, compared to L.A. I could just meet up my friends really easily. Food basically just comes to you, right? But it's just in terms of hours working, it was a lot. If you never went to Vietnam, you would only see, like, this one part which your parents presented you. Yeah. But now you're able to see, like, full circle. Yep. Yep. I think so. Yeah. And that took a lot of meeting people, talking to people, getting really deep, having the language so that I can actually meet people from all walks of life in Vietnam, you know, from, like, rich people to, like, a fisherman to young people to older people and just experiencing a lot. And then it's, like, your view of everything is so wide that whenever somebody says like, oh, these guys are bad or this happened, blah, 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 you're like, yeah, but you know, there's so many other people that are not like that or have experienced something completely different that you can't, you can't just pigeonhole it anymore. So let's 
go back to when you were, how did one year become five years? Uh, I, I, sorry, <laughs> I had a Vietnamese girlfriend at that time. You got locked down. <laughs> yeah, I got locked down. I did. No, no, no. That's facts, dude. That's facts. Yeah, I definitely got, I, I got, I got locked down. Um, yeah, I was in a long relationship. Let's just say like it didn't work out and it lasted way too long. It yeah. should have ended a lot sooner. But hey, I was young. I was not good at communicating. And looking back now, again, it's, we were from a different culture. You know, like um, I'm not saying that Vietnamese girls here and Vietnamese overseas can't like mesh. Yeah. Obviously they can, but in our case, it didn't really work. Maybe I was a little more American than I thought, and she was a little more Vietnamese than I thought. So when the relationship ended, I assume did you that was the reason you're like, okay, I'm gonna come back home, or what was the reason after the five years? Like, yeah, five years is enough. I'm gonna go home. Yeah. So my my best buddy passed away actually. So I moved there. Um, I moved here. I moved here to Vietnam with my best buddy from high school, and a few years in, three, two and a half years in, he got really sick, and then. Yeah, he passed away here. And so that just, that wrecked me, you know? That put me on a crossroads of like, what is this place? What am I doing with my life? Like, what is death? You know, it just kind of flipped everything upside down. There was a really long time when I hated this place yeah. because of that. I felt so much guilt for like being responsible for even suggesting coming to Vietnam with him. So that made me uh, reflect a lot and I felt like I really need to go home. I really needed to step away because I needed to just look at my life again from you know a bigger viewpoint. I spent a long time just kind of growing, you know, uh, just looking deep into life, trying to figure out what really makes me happy, you know, because what else is better to shake you up than like your own mortality, you know? It's just like, hey, I'm here in this life, like I gotta make the most of it, you know, because people, people, um, people leave this life, yeah. you know, they don't come back. So it's just like, hey, I, I, I really need to figure out what, what's gonna make me happy. And then it, it was a long process of like, I can't blame Vietnam, you know, for what happened. I can't blame myself. And I know it sounds like kind of, you know, weird spiritual or whatever, but you know, I, I hear his voice kind of telling me like, hey man, we were really happy here. You know, and I know you're happy here. So if this is what you want, you know, like go back, you know, and, 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 and live that life. Process of like grieving and then coming back home. How long were you back in America for? And what did you start to put together your roadmap to come back to where you are today? Mm -hmm. I, I stayed as a teacher. So I went back and got my credential to teach high school in California. And then I got my master's. So I got my master's to teach English. And I knew that both of those things would still be very useful for me here in Vietnam. So it's like, in case I ever wanted to go back, you know, that's only gonna help, right? And I just kind of held it off for a really long time. But then COVID hit. So when COVID hit, again, that was like deep reflection, right? Time to kind of rethink everything. And what I saw was like, man, my job is tough. You know, teaching high school in LA, I love the kids so much, but it's a tough job. You know, public school teachers over there shoulder a lot. So then... Um, Can you share how much you were making? As a yeah, so because of my credential and my degrees, I kind of like hit the top of the scale, sort of. So I was doing maybe like 7,000 gross in California, which is very expensive to live. Is that even like... For a single person, is that 7K a month in gross? That's like, what, five? Is that yeah. enough to survive? <laughs> I would say so, yeah. yeah. I would say that's pretty solid. Weirdly, um, for the most part, up until COVID kind of put this idea in my mind, like, hey, man, like, I'm actually not really satisfied with this life. But leading up to that, I was really happy. Yeah, yeah everything was predictable, safe, you know, expensive. We were working a lot, but it was all, like, the grind that we knew. You know, like, this was e at least easy and predictable. Was it the, do you think, was the grind that you knew, or is the grind that you were mi mirroring from what you saw as a kid? Yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah, it, we, we were, I would say a lot of it is mirroring, because all of our family were there kind of confirming, like, you guys are doing good. This is what you should be doing. Getting married, having a solid job, right? Working your way to, you know, a mortgage, 
having kids, you know, it was just like all laid out for us. And we were on that path. And I have to say, like, it felt like we were doing the right thing, you know, and we were comfortable. But like internally? Internally, I think... 2021, like, what was, like... You know what? The crazy thing is, like, I think internally, I was good. Yeah. You know, I was good. I was at peace. My whole world got shattered by my friend passing away. So I did a long, long journey of reflecting, getting spiritual, and, like, just getting really happy with myself. And I was in a really good place. So I would say that, ultimately, the decision to leave everything and come here didn't come from a place of like, you know, I was stressed out. I had to escape the US. I was like, you know, trying to run away from something, you know, like I was actually good, you know, but I wanted to come back here. I love this place, you know? So like, it, it wasn't like, I gotta escape something. It's like, I just wanna be here, <laughs> you know? Toward something. Yeah, I'm running towards something, you know? I, I'm making this choice out of clarity and out of just joy. And this is like, both places make me happy, but I'm going to choose this place because I just like it more. Because I think that's like the healthier mindset to approach Vietnam or just any country. Because a lot of people are like, oh my God, America is so expensive. I'm going to run away and all my problems are going to be magically solved. But it's like, no, you're going to bring your problems that you had back home. 100%. Back here. 100%. Partying, whatever. you. It's going to happen. Yeah. So help us understand more of that journey. So like you met your partner that you're currently with today, your wife. So you, you are actually the example of selling everything and then coming here, but not in the perspective of scarcity, in the perspective of pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. So like, what did you sell? How much did you save up? And when did you be like, okay, honey, Vietnam. Oh man, no, we did something even crazier. So during COVID, we were um, mostly locked down together at her place. I was teaching online, she had a tech job, so she was just working off her laptop. And then one day I just had this idea like, hey, let's just quit everything for a year yeah. and just do whatever we want, you know? And I just kind of like threw it out there. And then I went home and I like crunched the numbers. And because I had been doing a lot of traveling, I, I already lived in Vietnam overseas and I had an idea. I was like, we, we could do it, you know? And then uh, my wife, she was at a tech job that she wasn't like super happy at. And her dream was always to do life coaching. And I was like, you can do that. You know, let's just spend a year and just like do stuff that we want to do. No one's telling us what to do with our time. We don't have a boss. We don't have a schedule. We just do whatever we want. And I threw in like, let's travel. Let's go around the world because I was itching to travel. Can I ask you, was there a number that you like, okay, this is enough for a whole year? Like, what was your budget? So our budget was, I think, around 50K, yeah, for like 25 countries for a year. Yeah. So we sold our cars um, and then uh, sold some crypto. Uh, so 50K is actually just our cash on top of our savings. This is from liquidating your assets. Liquidating yeah. our assets, right? So like, yeah, so we, we were still responsible adults enough to have some savings at that time. So we were going to go and just go crazy with 25K. And, and did you blow all of that? We pretty much did. <laughs> yeah, but we made it to like 14 countries. So in the end, I did, we had to dip into savings, but we, we had accrued enough, right? And we're not balling, right? We did world travel and then living in Vietnam, me as a high school teacher and my wife um, as an implementation consultant at a big tech company, like she was making like maybe 3K a month in California uh, after taxes. And I was making about like 4,500 to 5K, right? And we basically just lived off of my income and all, all of hers, we just saved, 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 saved for like almost two years. And then we did it. Yeah, yeah we just took off and then after. So is that where the name Chris Trent Travels came from originally? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so originally I was fantasizing about being like this YouTube travel couple where we would actually make all our money back within a few months because we're gonna get big on YouTube. That shit did not happen. Nope. No, no, no. it was a disaster actually because, uh, yeah, my wife was just, she was not, she was just not into it, you know? And like, it kind of became super annoying and just traveling that much was not really a good idea because it's so stressful. It's like back to back, it's like the ultimate test 
of wow. a couple. Wow, while you're documenting and being like yeah. a personality on camera. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that didn't happen. So then we ended up here in Vietnam. So we had like a long four month stay where after 14 countries, man, we were just tired of traveling, tired of like sitting next to each other on an airplane, like stuff like that. So we just kind of like locked ourselves in, didn't do anything. And then it was during those four months that I was like, man, maybe we should stay here. You know, I mean, during that time too, we were watching like interest rates go up. So we were going to do like some traveling for a year, come back. We told our parents, we're going to have babies, you know, like, and, you know, they're all waiting for us. But just watching the interest rates go up, we can't get a house anymore. So we had to kind of rethink. And since I had been here, it didn't feel that hard to, to make that decision to stay longer. For you, though. For me. <laughs> right. So I convinced her, you know, and... It was, it's still a process right now. You know, I can't say that she 100% is all in on like super long term here. Yeah, but we're still working on it. Tell the audience how old are we? 38. Yeah, I'm almost 40 now. My wife's 35. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, we didn't do this as young kids. You know, this is like a adult decision. I wouldn't say midlife crisis because I'm a very happy person, but... You know, it is kind of unconventional, you know, just like a lot of our friends have got homes now. They got like two kids by now. And we're just like, we're bouncing and just starting a whole new life in Vietnam. So it is kind of crazy. You and your partner are like, how are we going to make money now? Like, what was your process and what do you do now? I kind of got into TikTok, content creating, initially doing English teaching material on TikTok. And it took off, surprisingly. My dream has always been to be here to open a physical school. And that like took a detour when social media started kind of helping out a lot more. And, and, and my presence got bigger. And so people were like, hey, do you teach? You know, like, and then I started just develop, developing my own online courses and teaching online. And then that gave me so much flexibility, freedom that I didn't want to open a school anymore. I'm like, I'm basically a school right now. I'm an online school. I'm just by myself. Uh, and it felt so nice, you know, because I did like more than 10 years working for a school. Now I'm my own school. I'm designing everything myself and getting my own students on my own, marketing myself. And it got to the point where I was able to scale up. Most people see Chris and it's like, wow, awesome viral content, very funny, relatable. But also living here, it took like 10 years. Like people don't, it, nothing happens over. This guy was teaching 10 Five years? And then... Well, all together, like 13 years 13 total. years teaching. Yeah, yeah. So 13 years of teaching and then taking that and self-reflection and being in Vietnam for so long. Spontaneously, six months in, you started growing your content. But most people don't see that, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I can't deny the fact that... You put in the work. It was a long journey. Yeah. And it was a lot of work. It was hours, 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 you know, making content. And... Um, yeah, doing multiple channels, doing everything myself. It was, it was a grind. It was a lot of work. If someone's out there and they're 18, maybe 20, 25, 30, maybe 40, and they're like, I'm considering moving to Vietnam. What are your three general tips of things you better know before coming here? Mm, I would say, like, don't do it to make a bunch of money like me. You know, like, don't make that your goal because it might not happen. I've seen a lot of businesses fail here. And that wasn't really like my big intention to make it that big. Come here to experience first. I think that's the number one number thing. Number one, beta test. Yeah, number beta two. beta test it. Yeah. Number two. Number two is don't underestimate your the, the importance of having a good circle of people, right? Find your people here. Really be on the lookout for anyone taking advantage of you or any kind of negative people, right? Like just be around the right people. Yeah. Right, really seek out good people here. Um, that's gonna be everything. Community, yeah, locals plus expats, like-minded people, whatever. Yeah, find those people. So yeah, be very curious, right? Be curious about Vietnamese people, be curious about Vietnamese culture, and you'll find that you will not get bored. So one of the biggest things that I get with my content is people like, oh my God, Peter, your Vietnamese is so good. I'm like, no, man, it's not, it's not that great. 
I think it's above for like people back home. <laughs> but I think Chris is like, bro, you're, you've been studying. It's like almost native Southern. So it's like, where can they find you in terms of like helping them get to even my level, even better? Yeah, so it's a big, big dream project of mine to help people have the language. Because looking back, like that was my key to really getting in and meeting everybody, um, locals, and really understanding Vietnam at a deep level. So my course currently is on Thinkific platform. There's a link. You don't have to buy it yet, but you know if you want to support me and you really want to get, you know, Vietnamese down, right? Like I, I, I want to create quality Vietnamese lessons for people that make it really easy for them to learn. And yeah, you can find me on on Thinkific. Yeah, so even if you don't buy it. Uh, you can just sign up and then, you know, find out about when we actually launch, like, upcoming courses. But I uh, appreciate you, bro. Yeah, dude. Coming on. Thanks for sharing the, your memories. Appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, see you all in the next one.